Let's talk about differential forms, part four. And here we're going to get to some, some meaty stuff. And for example, how to integrate a two form and how that automates a process that, in retrospect, is hopefully going to look a little kludgy. First thing I want to talk about um, is well, let's go back to this picture we had on the computer. Uh, this big box with kind of separated out into into crates and we want to think of there's there's uh, fluid flowing through here and that was the picture for taking DX which is the slices that are uh, sort of in the plane of the page and taking the wedge product of that with DY and that's a two form because it has two one forms put together basically or that's one reason why I call it a two form um, and I want to note that that's, there's, there's definitely an analogy here to the uh, idea of taking I cross J to be K. Because notice the direction in which the fluid is flowing is K. So that's definitely very, very much true that the wedge product of two one forms is very analogous to the cross product of vectors. What's different is that two one forms are not wedging together to create a new one form. They're creating a two form. And in fact, that kind of bookkeeping, which might seem, seem a little unnecessary, is really crucial <coughs> to the power of this. Uh, one thing I want to mention is that the cross product is only definable in three dimensions. You can only take these two vectors, take something like the cross product and produce a vector in three dimensions. This is definable everywhere. And that's a, a big hint of the, the real power of, of this new theory. Okay, um, now I actually want to erase those arrows though. Uh, actually, well, let me, let me say one more thing about orientation. I mentioned orientation before. If you put a surface over here and you think of integrating this two form over a surface, it's the idea of just counting the tubes of flux, we need orientations and we want to say that there, you're going to get a positive flux if the orientations match or you know positive integral and negative otherwise and um, I just want to make it much more obvious whether those orientations match, and I want to I want to get away from this cross product idea, again because that's something that traps us in R three. That's one of the big reasons for, for going to forms. What I want to do is I want to look at what's a way to describe orientation of a surface that's intrinsic to the surface that doesn't use that one extra dimension. Because it turns out if there isn't an extra dimension for in two dimensions, or if there's too many extra dimensions, it's hard to use a normal vector to, to describe an orientation. That's what we've been doing, and it's a trick. It's a bad trick in general. And so I'm just going to describe an orientation by a swirl. Okay, sort of a consistent dis direction of swirliness on the uh, the surface. And if you want to, you can think, okay, use the right-hand rule. And if, if I draw a swirl, you can think of the right-hand rule then creating like a screw thread thing that goes with the right-hand rule and produces the normal vector, if you want to. But really, the swirl is a much more fundamental way to describe orientation. For example, if that surface, let me redraw my form here. If that surface were actually um, a pair of vectors, a parallelogram spanned by a pair of vectors, then we know that the orientation of that, to describe that as an oriented little bit of surface, it really depends on whether you say u then v or v then u. You can, if you want, think about, oh, I, I describe that by taking the, the cross product of u and v with this, but we want to get away from that. I'll, what I'm going to do is I'm going to orient that little parallelogram by just taking a swirl that starts in the direction of u and then goes in the direction of v and then just keeps swirling around like that. If it were v then u, it would swirl in the other direction. Okay, so that's the orientation of a surface described intrinsically as a swirl. What about the orientation of uh, the two form? Well, dx wedge dy, okay. The dx planes were going like this. Something weird about the picture there. Uh, I guess it's okay. Um, and the dy planes are going like this. And I'm just going to orient that in, in a similar way. I'm just going to, in each tube, I'm going to orient this. So you could kind of think of it as it's like a, tu a tube of swirly flux. It's kind of going up and swirling at the same time. I don't know if that's really great. Okay. And what we're going to do is we're going to say if these, these swirls agree, that's when we get a plus. If they disagree, that's when we get a negative. Okay. So that makes it all intrinsic and emphasizes what I was saying at the end of the last video, which is that the order absolutely matters. And in particular, remember that dy wedge dx 
would swirl the opposite way. It's minus of dx wedge dy. Okay. So let's draw a couple more pictures and then see how we can calculate with these things. Um, what about dy wedge dz? Okay, dy are these planes here in the y direction, and um, the dz is going to be the is going to be horizontal planes like this, and so we're going to get again sort of tubes of flux. But if we wanted the to picture the fluid flowing, the right flowing flowing toward us in the x direction. Okay, and let's see, is it really x or is it minus x? Well, let's do the swirl version instead. Let's clear out one of these guys. The swirl version says go along the y direction first, um, and then the z direction. And so we're going to go along. Um, oh, actually, yeah, so let's see. No, I'm getting confused. So here's our y, here's our z. The rule was, so it may, I probably didn't say it as well as I could have the last time. The rule is, let me just make this a little prettier. Cut out some of the extra junk here. Okay. Okay. So the rule is that I go in the y direction and then in the z direction like that. Okay. And if I use the right hand rule there, that's going to be coming out at me. It is really going to be in the x direction. Okay. So there's the swirl of the orientation of that guy. Okay. Um, one more picture, just something cooler. Sine phi d phi wedge d theta. Ooh, what's that going to look like? Well, what the heck does that mean? What are phi and theta? Oh yeah, that's spherical coordinates. There's nothing that says we have to start out with um, the x's and y's. This is a perfectly good one form. It can be expressed in terms of the x's and y's by our rule for d of a function. This can be expressed in terms of x, y's, and z's in terms of the, our rule for d of a function that's analogous to the gradient. But we don't actually have to put it in terms of x's and y's. And then here, I'm multiplying it by a function. And we can always do that, just like with vectors and vector fields. We can take uh, some interesting two form and scale it in different, with different ways. What this is going to do is it's going to make those tubes of flux either denser or less dense depending on um, what, the, what the value of sine phi is. Well, it turns out what this looks like is if I take a sphere and I just take a uniform uh, lat latitude and longitude grid. And now what I want to think of, it's, I'm not very going to be very good at drawing this, but what I want you to picture is take this, this sphere. It's not a solid sphere. It's, um, it's hollow, and there's tubes of flux. There's one tube of flux coming from the center for every one of these squares. And so there's a tube of flux coming to this. It's not really a square. One, in each, each one of these like quadrangles. There's a tube of flux coming out here. And so there's flux coming out in all directions. And notice that the spacing of the, the two forms does change as we, um, as we go towards the poles or away from the poles. Um, and that's, it's a little, we'd have to say a little bit more about it to really verify that this, the sine phi is the right factor to do that. But I wanted to do that because this should look familiar. This is exactly the ds for the sphere in the spherical coordinates. It's something that we're actually used to integrating. If you just take out the wedge and you don't have this picture of um, the, uh, the, f the tubes of flux. So we'll, we'll definitely come back to that example. OK, so I've shown you a lot of pictures. It's been pretty hand wavy so far. I want to show you uh, how, and we'll, it'll take a minute to get there, but how do you integrate like the double integral over a surface of a two form? Like, let's take, for example, dx wedge dy. That was our original example with the tubes of flux going up. And then let's just multiply it by some function f that varies in x, y, and z. OK. Well, that's going to be the, the motivation here. I just need to, to tell you uh, three things. OK. One, uh, actually, maybe four things. OK. One, I need to remind you that dx wedge dy is minus dy wedge dx. That's true for any two one forms. It's anti-commutative. That's called anti 
commutativity. And it's just like we're familiar with that from the cross product. Okay. Second is that um, for any forms, let's just say alpha, it's, con it's often common to just take random Greek letters to be random forms. So this is just some PDX plus QDY plus RDZ. Uh, it's got a distributive property, alpha wedge beta plus alpha wedge gamma. I'm not going to prove that, but there's no way that we would use the term product if this weren't distributive over the addition. Uh, oh, and now we haven't even defined addition of one forms. Trust me, it's uh, it's pretty obvious. Okay, it's just like adding vector fields. Okay, and similar to that, if I have like a a function here, and I wedge them together, that function just comes out. If you look at the rules, for example, for a cross product of vector fields, it's exactly the same. It's just remember the output for the cross product of vector fields is a vector field. That's cheating, and it uses R three. Here, the output is always a two form. These are always two forms coming out. Okay, so that's the basic algebra. Then we all want to understand how to deal with parameterizations. Okay, and so that's called the pullback of a two form, and it's going to be very similar for an n form. Okay, and this is where. Uh, is another place. It's maybe the biggest place where they come into their own. Okay, so I've got a surface. Here's what we're trying to do. I've got this surface, and remember the way we uh, we describe it explicitly, especially if we want to integrate over it, is we have some domain D in R2 and a map, let's say capital Phi, that actually whose image is that guy inside. You know that guy's inside R3, and we know that to integrate anything over that surface, or at least the, the procedure we used to have, and it's going to be the same here, um, to integrate a vector field, we have to convert everything to really be an integral over here. And that's what's going to be much more natural in this case. And in fact, I'm using natural in a very precise and extremely general sense, but I won't really say much more about that. OK, so here's this form. And it's going to be the integral over d and we have to convert this guy to being a two form. It's still going to be a two form on R2. And let's think about what a two form on R2 should look like. Well, that would be like dx wedge dy, for example, would be here's dx, here's dy. It's not hard to see how to, uh, how to take that and pair that with a region and get a number. You just count the squares. It's like counting tubes, but it's simpler. And what is that? It's really going to be. Um, just it's just going to be an ordinary integral in two dimensions. We'll see how that works. Okay, so it does make sense to if we could somehow cre take take this two form on here. You know, there's this picture. I have this picture of the tubes of flux flowing through this guy. If I could convert that to some sort of grid pattern here, then it's plausible that I might be able to integrate that in a simpler way. And the way we denote that is we say phi upper star of this whole du dude. And this is denote this is you call this the pullback of this form by phi. And so that so far that's just a notation. It's kind of a an expression of a hope that there's some sort of two form that we could create out of this form and this parameterization data that lives on a simpler region, just a simpler uh, region in the plane and that that hopefully we could figure out how to integrate that thing. Okay? And so here's where it gets cool, that that's really, really simple. And so I'm just going to assert some stuff. It's kind of half definition, half unproved theorem. I'm going to assert that pulling back a form preserves all the operations that we've seen so far. Function times form, I'm going to say that I can pull back the f, and I can pull back the two form separately and then just multiply them afterwards. Okay, You can almost see that as a definition of how to pull back, of one of the aspects of pull back. Okay, so I'm going to leave that alone and talk about that what that is in a, in a minute. It's going to be simple. I'm also going to assert that, um, that the f pullback of a wedge product, not just uh, multiplying by a scalar at every point and making things bigger or smaller, but this funky thing that, of wedge product that converts two one forms into a two form, that that also is respected by the pullback. And this is really what naturality means, basically, by the way. 
It means this, these kinds of equations in general. Okay, we'll get to figuring out phi star f. And then the last thing is that phi star dx should be the same as d of phi star x wedge d. Remember, we have defined this idea of d on a function. Um, oops. Oh, yeah, I guess I just put the parentheses in a different place. We've defined the idea of d on a function is the analog of the gradient if for one forms. And the claim is that if I pull back the result of doing that, it's the same thing as if I pull back the function and then I take d of it. Now, this wouldn't be helpful or meaningful if it weren't nice and simple to describe what phi star f is. But let's, let's look at the picture again. Here's our region d. That goes into R3 and parameterizes this surface. And then all these three things, f is a function on R3. x is really just a function on R3. It's just a very simple one. It just says, what's the first coordinate? y is a very simple function on R3. So those guys are functions to R. Phi star, f, let's see, so like f, for example. Well, there's a very natural way to take this function f and create out of it a function on d, which is what we want. We just compose. So it's just f composed with phi. And guess what? That's exactly what we, we must have expected to see this coming out of the integral, because we know that to do this integral, we have to take uh, our function data and express it in terms of the parameters. So this is really just taking f of x, y, z and turning it into, let's say, the parameters of u and v, into f of u and v. And the great thing is, that's all we really need to know, because that's the only place that phi star now appears, is in its role as composition. Okay, so the upshot of that is that the thing we're going to end up integrating at phi star of dx, which dy, is f just turned into something on the, param on the parameter space, the d, the domain, times d of x composed with phi, wedge d of y composed with phi. Now, it's still a little abstract.